Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome tonight Jackie M. and Aaron Harbour, active, spirited, careful, thoughtful, tireless contributors in art and culture. In their art space and other curatorial projects, they support artists based on their enthusiasm for the work with a touch of the absurd and the delicate. And in their day jobs, they promote a wider cultural sphere such as electronic and experimental music activism and produce elevated forms of public art continuously engaging the Bay Area and frequently reaching beyond. During their seminar this week at PNCA, they're presenting and discussing projects demonstrating an important if overlooked aspect of a healthy art ecosystem, care. We could already feel from a distance this ethos pouring through the in internets. It is wonderful to have them here in Portland despite the social distancing. And we hope to spend more time with them after this nightmare is over. Welcome. Glad to be here. Okay, good evening. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Jackie M and Aaron Harbour as we welcome them to PNCA for the Summer 2020 Visiting Artists Lecture Series. Jackie M is a curator, writer, editor, uh, based in Oakland, California. She is the co-founder and director of et al. and et al. etc. in San Francisco alongside her partner, Aaron Harbour. Jackie has organized numerous exhibitions throughout the Bay Area, and her writing has appeared in a variety of art publications and exhibition catalogs. Jackie is currently a lecturer at California College of Arts and Mills College, she holds a BA in art history from Mills College and an MA in curatorial practice from California College of the Arts. Erin Harbour is an artist, curator, writer, author, and DJ. Along with Jackie, he is curator and co-director of et al, and et al, et cetera. In addition to his work at et al, he has curated exhibitions across the Bay Area, New York, and Mexico City. He is director of the art blog journal FYI, journal.fyi, which fe uh, features art exhibitions from the Bay Area and beyond with the goal of creating a lasting record of local contemporary art and connecting it to the broader art context. Aaron has authored several books on subjects ranging from ghosts to artificial intelligence and his ongoing music podcast series is called Timber which explores new and old strange music ranging in genre from experimental to world to folk. As an artist, Aaron has e exhibited extensively throughout the Bay Area. As co-directors of et al. Gallery in San Francisco, Jackie and Aaron, along with Kevin Kruger, have created a gallery program that serves as a site for exhibitions and experimental events working with its select roster, as well as other local and international artists, writers, and curators. Et al. was founded in 2013 in the basement of a Chinatown laundromat, creating a refreshing change from the traditions of art world gatherings and became the place to find underground culture and emergent conceptual art. In 2017, Et al. opened its second location, Et al. etc a storefront gallery in the Mission neighborhood of San Francisco. We are very happy to have them here with us tonight, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Jackie M. and Aaron Harbour. Well, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, we're very glad to be here um, in this strange time in a place that's already strange um, to us, uh, Portland, a place we, we like to, to visit. Um, yeah, let me share my screen. Get the looped version first. Let's see. And then let's do this thing. All right, that's a good place to start. I like. I like let's start with a blank cube. I like that we're sitting. <laughs> we're we're sitting in a white cube. Um, we're we're staying in this lovely apartment in our house. Um, and yeah, there's nothing on the walls. I, I suppose to leave space for the the 
people who stay here to decorate, but I don't know, it's, it's fitting. So, so um, I'm Aaron Harbour, <laughs> as mentioned uh, previously. I was uh, born in 1978 in San Antonio, Texas. Um, this is, I'm the taller individual. It's my younger brother, um, who's a complicated human, and my great grandfather in the foreground, who passed away not long after that. We were visiting my great grandmother's uh, a grave. My, my great grandfather is in a long line of men named Harbor who are troublemakers. I'm the least. Uh, trouble meddlesome of, of my family. My great every story of, about my great grandfather is is like in 16 he joined the Merchant Marines and sailed around the world. He fell into a bear pit when he was two uh, at the zoo. A uh, motorcycle blew up between his legs and a bolt was permanently embedded in his leg, etc. I don't know. That's yeah, Texans. Um, I grew up kind of a nerd. Uh, I still am. I still have glasses. Uh, I was good at at the the academic parts of school, but always an artist. I always, always, always making art. Um, I can remember a birthday when I was really young, like maybe seven or eight, in which instead of toys for Christmas, everybody in my family, and my extended family, because it's a lot of childhood divorce, there's, there's grandparents and other grandparents and other grandparents, um, just gave me art supplies. And I would just, that's all I ever did. So, um, yeah, through, let's see. As a little boy, I, I, I spent all my life pretty much in, in, in Texas. Um, there was a brief spat. My parents ran away. They were 17 and 18 to California um, and with me. And, but eventually ended up living back in Texas with my grandparents, um, making art, uh, being, being a, weird, a weird version of a Texan. My, my grandparents, uh, my family is, is, is Hispanic, Mexican. Um, my grandmother, grandmother and grandfather speak nothing but Spanish to each other. Um, for the most part, um, but neither my brother nor I uh, were, were taught Spanish or had any interest in learning whatsoever. Um, a, a profound lack of, of curiosity. Um, and I think in the hands of, for the, the reasoning that my grandparents took this path, I think was a, a classic story of a, a kind of forced assimilation um, into just being Californian because my, despite being minorities themselves, my, my grandfather was incredibly racist. Um, and so, yeah, so Texas until uh, high school. And after high school, I, I moved, followed my parents' footsteps, um, although I'm not sure my parents finished high school, and moved to uh, California to go to the San Francisco Art Institute for undergraduate studies, where I studied new genres um, out of the like childhood idea that like when I saw that listed as a thing you can study, I didn't want to study old genres. I was like, wait, new genres is an option? Let's do that. And that literally is how I, what I signed up for, and which was great. I still I did all the painting I did as a kid, but I added ceramics. I did used video. I did computer stuff. Started to learn computer music. Um, being uh, this gentleman, uh, um, uh, Martin Schmidt of the duo Matmos, which is an electronic band. He was the guy in charge of all the equipment at SFAI. And he was very encouraging to to use the equipment and to learn how to you know do a little bit of computer stuff. So. To this day, I make, still make a little bit of bad electronic music. Um, between not finishing undergrad at, at SFAI um, and eventually getting back in the art world, I kept making things, but focused mostly on music, DJing here and there, um, going to see a lot of art, but not going to art openings, not participating in any sort of art community. Um, I'll, talk, I'll talk about you for a second. Or I can talk. Yeah, oh Jackie. my god! <laughs> I didn't know which pictures of me of me as like a kid that he would put in there, but here here we are. Um, so I was born in San Francisco. Um, I uh, my parents came from South Korea from Seoul uh, when both of my older sisters were really were like basically babies. And I'm the only one who was born in the United States. Um, so, and I was a, a really, really shy kid. And um, I've, my two older sisters are both, were both much older than me. The um, closest in my age is 13 years older than me. So I was always like the only kid. And uh, so I was either always reading or I was always drawing when, um, whenever there was like, meals or like 
you know, if you go out to, to like dinner with like your, my parents and I was just like, oh, I'm just going to pull out the markers and draw on the placemats. Um, so I was always doing art. What did you have more pictures? I don't know if I have more pictures. I don't think I do. Oh. Oh, this oh, is around when we met. Yeah. Okay. So I went to uh, the School of the Arts High School in San Francisco and as a visual art uh, concentration, and um, which was a, a really hugely inform like formative experience of like always being around artists and different kinds of artists. Um, <clears throat> and then I went out to study. Um, I went to undergrad, started my undergraduate at Hampshire College in Massachusetts and decided I really did not want to be there. And so I came back to the Bay Area and went to Mills College, um, studying art history and with uh, a little bit of art making. And I had like a work study job at the museum. Uh, da, da, da. So, uh, so I worked after graduating and I worked at like a, like just like a job because I needed a job. And uh, while I was there, I also was like interning at different arts organizations, like on the weekends, and uh, deciding that I I wanted to go back to school for reasons unknown. <laughs> and uh, and um, I was interested in from working in the museums and working in different. Um, arts organizations. I was interested in exhibition making and, um, and just like how to work, like just working with artists. Um, but I knew I didn't want to make art anymore. Um, so I decided to, to apply to different museum studies or curatorial practice uh, programs. And um, there was one program that I think like who has like professors that I really liked at SFAI and but then they accepted me without doing an interview and I felt like that should have been much more difficult um, and the interview process with uh, CCA was actually a little bit more rigorous and so I was like okay well let's let's go to CCA um, there were my cohort was a, a group of 12 women and we it was a relatively grueling program of like theory and history and study and like just practical study but maybe not enough practical study it's very geared towards like putting you on the path of working in a museum where you're just kind of like on your way to become like a superstar curator which was not necessarily the path that i was interested in because i, I we would take these trips or like do these like group class studio visits with like these superstar artists like i think we took a trip to vancouver and we went to stan douglas's like in crazy studio complex with like banks of computers for people to do photo editing and video editing and all this stuff. And I was like, he's never going to work, remember any of us, or this is just like a blip in his life. And uh, it felt really kind of disingenuous between like the way that I wanted to be working with artists. Um, it's, it wasn't useless information, but it was still like, it wasn't really what I wanted to do, which was um, to work with with artists and work closely with um, with them and kind of really uh, with my peers. Yeah, so, so I met Jackie as she was completing graduate school. So she was in the middle of this, this rigorous project working on her thesis, working on a, a group curated exhibition to be held at the Wattis Institute of Art, which was, uh, this was a group, the 12 curators, each picking one or two artists, mostly one artist, and then like working together to organize a show with those artists. And while they were all really pretty tightly knit, they were, you know, clicks even amongst the 12, people more invested, putting more or less time in, it was tough for her. So it was, I met, her in, a, in a, an incredibly high stress period. There was, you know, a lot of like graduate school tears and stress, um, which was, I, I think, a really good, it's a, a test of a kind of a nascent relationship. Like, like that, we made it through that. I was like, all right, well, this is fine. You know, <laughs> I, this is this is her at her, you know, most vulnerable and and uh, most at her wit's end. And and I I liked her very much then. 
So that came to an end. She finished her, her studies, um, at which point most of her cohort were starting to look for jobs, including her, looking for jobs all over the country. Uh, to, you know, and at that point, you, nobody goes from getting that graduate degree to, to being the main curator of a major museum. You end up being an assistant somewhere. You're doing a lot of logistics for someone who's actually curating the shows. And uh, I think she, in her heart, wanted to do shows and curate shows. Um, we talked about it vaguely, but it was it's it was it seemed like the point of going to school to become a master cura master in curating would be to curate shows. Um, I a friend an acquaintance really had a space a project space in his apartment, and he had done it previously had an apartment gallery closed it because it was too stressful moved to Oakland and then did it again and and halfway a year into that program he's like all right this is too much work I can't handle it I'm looking for someone to co curate this space um, I saw this as an opportunity to to get Jackie to curate. Um, and also to give her a reason to stay in the Bay Area, which I, I like the Bay Area a lot at this point. Today, I've been there 20 something years, 22 years, something like that. Um, I'm happy to stay there and I didn't want her to move away for a job. So I was like, let's, let's curate. So I emailed the guy, I'm like, I'm a curator, sure. Like uh, my, my girlfriend and I would love to take over curating at this space. Um, so we curated our first show there soon thereafter. This was a, a show about, uh, is, we started with kind of a basic kind of thematic exhibition style. So the first show was about, was it about first silence? Yeah. Uh, first silence. show we did was about silence. And so uh, we talked to a bunch of artists, mostly a lot of artists within Jackie's uh, cohort at CCA, but also, you know, people adjacent to that crowd to make works about silence. This is a, a work by Brandon Olson, who, who now primarily works in, in painting, but at this time had a very uh, conceptual sculptural practice. This was a, a lock groove he cut in the beginning of the record. So the record never starts. Um, again, it was not silent, right? Like this, this, or again is the wrong word, but it, it made a sound. It was, it was this, this constant lock groove sound that grew uh, rumblier and rumblier the, over the course of the exhibition. This is a piece by uh, Hilary Weideman on this large back wall. This window was a natural feature of this back wall. It led into a uh, office slash studio of the person who lived there. Um, she put a screen over it and projected a uh, film onto that screen. Um, the film was a, a film produced by pointing a digital camera at the sun. And the digital camera does not want to point at the sun. The sun is much brighter than the CCDs in a digital camera want to deal with. So the sun, the video is this kind of glowing central figure that glitches out as the, as the poor camera's brain struggles dealing with this sort of like too much, too much. Um, I think all, all together, like across our practice, we, we like things that are sort of an object misbehaving or an object refusing to do its, its job or, or some, an object that's struggling, like the record player is struggling to start the record or this camera struggling. On the wall, the, the pattern, the geometric pattern is string that has uh, like micro glass beads embedded into it, sort of like a 3M style. Like it's like the glass beads that you use in that um, like street, like for like public works will use to like for safety and street lines to kind of show the reflective, to like come out at night. <laughs> yeah, so at certain angles, it was fairly invisible, but in other angles, it would really uh, right, shine. Let's see. So we held lots of shows there. Um, the next show was about noise. We did, uh, it was really like a playground for us to experiment with what we could do. We did a show in which all the work was instructions based because we know of lots of work like that, like a, a conceptual art, historical conceptual art pieces that, you know, basically revolve around a set of instructions, anything from a soloette on around. And then it's left up to the curator or the, the more often than not the art handlers to realize that work and we always thought that there was, there was a strange disconnect because the curator didn't necessarily paint the soloette or uh, do the dance performance um, so we did a show in which the, we had to do everything that the artist told us to do which had a lot of benefits one it was it was a strange show with a, a lot of different kinds of work two 
since it was just instructions that afforded us with no budget to work with artists around the world. So this was our first, it was one of our first chances to work uh, with people elsewhere. I mean, we're always thinking about the Bay Area. We love the Bay Area and the artists there, but always trying to reach beyond and always looking beyond. This image is from a show, uh, it was the last show we did at MacArthur B. Arthur, which was the name of the gallery. Um, this show revolved around a work. Somebody had asked in a seminar yesterday if that ever happens, and this would be an example of that. Uh, this work by Joanna Billing is, who's a filmmaker, her films are often involve communities of people interacting in some way, often in sort of these interstitial moments. And this, this was this video that was essentially this group of young, uh, you know, uh, similar looking people in, in Europe waiting for something or preparing for something. It was very unclear. There's the sound of shuffling chairs. Uh, every once in a while, uh, there's a zoomed in picture of a copy machine making a copy that's white, nothing on it. Um, and that video was the inspiration for our last show. Here's that last show. Um, again, this is a, a great example of the sort of where we were coming from. But on the left was a video playing in the camera, the viewfinder of that camcorder. Um, this is a piece by, by Bob Linder, who was at the San Francisco Art Institute when I was there as kind of like the older cool kid um, who like went on to start a gallery called Queen's Nails, uh, eventually started another gallery called uh, Capital. And at this point is, is doesn't make work, but this was one of his last pieces that we squeezed out of him by being like, hey, Bob, you want to make a piece? He later uh, made another video piece for a group show that a friend curated. And we were just joking that we're apparently the only gallery that shows yeah, Bob we are Linder's, his gallery. Work, Linder's work. What was the gentleman who did the- That was Joseph Thomas. Joseph Thomas, the, the photo in the background. He was then in undergraduate studies at CCA. Um, the, the sculptural objects are these photos by Rosa Janosuska, a Polish-based sculptural photographer. Um, here's, here's a close-up of those. I think we were thinking a lot about what, what exhibitions are like when, there's, when the gallery is closed and when there's no one there to look at the work. Um, that was kind of a big thought that we were thinking of. And then, the, and in this instance, because uh, Kevin Clark, who uh, lived there, like he was living with the work and thinking about like how his experience and his time with the exhibition is like, is just this sort of vastly different experience than people who visit it. Talk to you, can you talk about this piece? Oh, okay. So this piece is um, by Anna Sagstrom, who, uh, I guess at the time she was based in Stockholm, but I think now she's based in New York. Um, but she, uh, we were talking about, when we reached out to her, we were talking to her about like feelings of like these idea of being on hold um, and the idea of like the sort of period of like, of in-betweenness and of, of like, uh, yeah, this very, interesting like interstitial space. Um, so this video piece, which the, has the Newton cradle, Newton's cradle along with it is of a man in a break room and every once in a while he gets up to play ping pong, but you never actually see the other person. Yeah, it, it was a, a mysterious video that she sent us. She sent us like this sort of instructions again. This is somebody sends the video via, you know, the file and then tells us how she'd like it displayed. In this case with this Newton's cradle, like something you'd see on a psychologist's desk. Um, and then in the video, and then the video is, is quite obscure, right? It's this person kind of seems like they're waiting. Just, you can't quite tell where they are. Um, I, it was like somewhat like to, not left to tell viewers at the time, but the, the gentleman was in a, a, a mental institution after like a violent crime. And this was just the sort of rec room, just, just biding time essentially. All right, so another piece from that show. This is a, a, a paint, sculptural painting by Liam Everett, who now really focuses on sculpture um, and with occasional performance work. But at the time he was, I mean, on painting mostly now, the time he was a little bit more fluid between sculpture and painting and what a painting can be. Yeah, I think what we were interested in, what we had talked with Liam a lot, a lot about was, 
the idea that artworks sort of take on these different lives that, you know, that an artwork in transit or in the studio has like a different life to it, that maybe it feels more malleable, it feels more like there's a lot more possibility, but then you bring it into the gallery, you hang up a painting, or in this instance, you lean the, the stands against the wall and have it settle, like it takes on like a different kind of weight, like a, like almost like this heaviness almost. Yeah, like this had definitely like had a posture, like it, it was imposing in its way. So that was our last show there. At that point, we'd grown quite a bit with what we thought we could do as curators. Like this show had artists from major galleries locally, artists from, from uh, abroad, um, people who, yeah, were, uh, Joseph I think was probably, you know, 20, 21, like all kind of given the same agency, we, uh, the same amount of care um, and shown together in this, this group show. And then at this point, the, the, around this time, the, the person who lived in this gallery was, was started to date a woman. And not every person wants to move into a space in which a third of the space is dedicated to a, a, a storefront gallery. So reasonably, he, it was time to close the gallery so he could live in his home. I mean, they, they're a happy ending. They've since gotten married, have a kid. Um, but that, the, the gallery ended. Um, then we got a strange email. So this is probably really small, depending on how you're viewing this. Um, Dear Jackie and Aaron, we're writing to inform you that the participation forms for NADA projects are now available. This was a, an art fair, NADA, and uh, New Art Dealers Association. Alliance. Alliance from, out of New York. This is an art fair in Miami that we had heard about um, as one of the, the kind of main art fairs, the art fair that I guess would be like most aligned with the kind of work we want to say. I want to say the coolest art fair, but that's stupid. Um, but <laughs> sort of, like the show, the, the kind of galleries we respect show there. And we got this email that's like, hey, you know, you're allowed to apply to this thing. And I, I emailed them back and I was like, why would I do that? Or like, like what are you talking you, about how right you, now? How do you, how do you how did you hear? Uh, what, oh, yeah, yeah, why do you know where we are? And they, they informed me like, no, no, we're not actually inviting you to apply. Like, we're, this is the form you fill out to do it if you want to do it. We had been invited by somebody because they liked our curating. Um, and so then we did it. We, we did an art never, fair. We'd never sold work ever. Oh, it's important to say that all in all our time at a project space, we always took the show serious, which is to say there was always a printed sheet of paper with, you know, text. There was always a list of all the names of all the pieces. There was always a price list available, but not present at the desk, even though nobody ever once asked how much a piece costs, we always followed through with the steps. Because um, we didn't, we don't want what we do to be the art. Like we're not the crazy, creative, strange making person. We are the facilitators for artists to, to be as serious or not serious as they want to be. So we did it. We did an art fair. Um, we had no idea what that meant. We didn't know anything. We had, we like, there were, are there a few art fairs that happen locally in the Bay Area and we went to one and that was kind of like mishmash of like some okay art and some really good work, but then a lot of really like work that we thought was terrible. And we knew friends who worked in art, art fairs and they were like, oh, it's terrible. It's like, it's a, a soul sucking garbage thing. Don't do it. <laughs> but, we, but we did it and, and succeeded. We randomly, the first minutes of the show, we sold some of those paintings on the wall. And I mean, we literally didn't know, I didn't even know that I, what to do. Like you ship all this work to Miami. I, I just assumed people would buy it and take it away from me. I hadn't arranged return shipping. Like I had to figure it all out on the fly. And by me, poor Jackie was just putting up with this at this point. I mean, the, the fair used to be held in a hotel and it was an exhausting experience. And it was kind of lovely because she could just go up and lay down, um, but we loved it. and. Soon thereafter, uh, one of the artists we showed, the artist who made the paintings, found a space for us to open a gallery together. We started talking about it. And I, yeah, immediately uh, spilled the beans um, to, to paraphrase, light, uh, was it Lighthouse? Um, and we did it. So our first gallery is beneath Union Cleaners. You can see it there in the center. You go down a hallway, down some stairs, art gallery. Um, this is the space we have to this day. It's, we're seven years later, which is insane to say. Um, 
And we've done just a crazy array of shows. Um, this is actually Anna Sogstrom again, huh, in the, in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've done, this is a show with like our roster. We started this, the gallery with a roster of six artists. Um, Cause that's the thing some galleries do. We didn't know what that meant to have a roster or we know va knew vaguely. We're still trying to understand it. Like what you, what our responsibility is to the artists on our roster. Yeah. I think like at the very beginning of talking to artists that we wanted to work with, we were very clear that, you know, we're still learning. We're, we're still trying to figure things out of, about how to do this in a way that didn't feel gross for everybody <laughs> and um, that our intention was to grow and kind of become more professionalized but like if they didn't mind growing with us that you know this was going to be sort of an interesting experiment of like how a new a different way of approaching a commercial gallery. So we we really encourage our artists to surprise us. Um, this is a show by one of the artists on our roster, Andrew Chapman, um, who makes perfectly uh, sellable paintings of a reasonable scale. But for the, his show with us, his first solo show, he made one large painting that had to be assembled on site, stretched on site. It took them like six or seven hours to stretch this painting on the left. On the center back wall, you can faintly make out what looks like like almost a projection of a further room, but that's a paint, he painted the wall. Uh, he plastered, extra plastered smooth my wall and then painted it. Um, he's always, he's always causing us trouble. But I think we, with a way that he approached the show and the way that we generally ap approach our shows is that we're as involved as the artist wants us to be. In this instance, Andrew didn't really want us involved. He's very, very precise and very, very particular. And he had like a very clear idea of what he wanted to do. And he was like, I don't need your help. Yeah, and we let it happen. This is a show by Anthony Desenza, another artist we represent. This show, the artist gave himself the cool assignment of rehanging the show four times with completely different work. He's always uh, challenging himself, challenging what it means, what an exhibition means, what authorship means. Um, the last show we had with him, he made a show of really strange, mostly found works, and then wrote three completely different statements, three completely different titles for each of the pieces. Like the, one, the pieces were by an artist from the 70s. One, the pieces were all by an Anthony Desenza. One, the pieces were all by a different Anthony Desenza. Who's Italian. Yeah. This is the most recent show we had um, by uh, Isabel uh, Francis McGuire. Um, this is a show curated by an outside gallery. This is curated by uh, Haynes Riley of Good Weather Gallery, a gallery in North Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, really a gallery that's been itinerant for a while now, um, sh doing shows at other people's spaces and art fairs around the world. This is a, a long-term promise by us that we would love to give you our space to use. And then he finally took it up. Uh, we talked about what it was and he produced this show. All works produced during COVID. Each of these, the, they're in the background, they're folded up t-shirts. Each t-shirt is from a different date. Maybe have some extra words on it or extra embroidery. Yeah, and I think it speaks to, to generally how we like to work with, not with artists, but also with guest curators or um, is the sort of trust and trust in their vision and trust in that they're gonna do a cool show and that they're like, a, for a curator to like suggest a really cool artists that whose work we may not have been super familiar with before but we trust that we trust in Haynes to, yeah. to not do a crappy show <laughs> yeah um a few years back now we open okay oh, this is a show by Brooke Sue um she's on the cover of our favorite magazine in the world right now Moose somehow or another I don't know how that was arranged but it happened and it's very cool um this work is in the magazine we can go back to Brooke Brooke was an artist that uh, Kevin Kruger, who we now run at all with, um, that he had worked with before and he was really interested in her work and kind of he introduced her work to us and that's sort of part what we kind of, I don't know, this like, this like trust in Kevin's vision and what he wanted to do. The, the next thing for us was a, a different second gallery than the second gallery we have now. We opened a space in this large art mall-ish building called Minnesota Street. It's a gallery with 10 buildings that are rich. Not 10 buildings. I mean, 10 galleries and two buildings. 
that uh, a, a rich couple built essentially with the idea that they would offer a lower rent space for art galleries that have been pushed out of um, uh, downtown by tech. Um, this, uh, what you're seeing here are, are sculptures by Matt Peruso. Um, in the background on the left are some drawings by uh, an older artist and filmmaker, Mike Kuchar. And then in the, the big yellow painting is by Koak, an artist we, we love. Um, we, this, here's a show by Sabelle Lyle, another one of our gallery artists. We, when they asked us which side of the different spaces on offer we wanted, we were like, we'll take the biggest one. I don't know why we, that was the idea, but it was insane. But we were like, that's, that's the, that's, that makes the most sense to us to justify doing this. And it was such a big space. We were like, what we will do with that space is instead of just- Well, I think what, I'm yeah, yeah. so I think what, uh, in our conversations with like the, both the owners of the building, but then also the folks who are managing the, the galleries coming in is this desire to have a program that brings in galleries from out of town and sort of uh, the intention that like maybe folks can like try out having spaces in here or showing their work to a different audience. Um, and so what the, the idea was that what we would do is to kind of split the exhibition space. So there was always a show by us, organized by us, but then a show organized by a guest gallery that we would invite. Um, yeah. So yeah, every show up until the last few were sh these, these split shows in which we gave half of our space rent free to a gallery from outside. We worked with galleries. The last was Queer Thoughts Gallery. Um, in New York. This is with Springsteen Gallery from Baltimore. We worked with uh, Cooper Cole from Toronto. Toronto. We worked from Document with Document from uh, Chicago. Uh, uh, Yachtapak, which was used to be in Mexico City but no longer exists, and uh, Spring yes, yeah, Springsteen in Baltimore. Yeah, and 100 percent, which was a tiny, tiny bedroom apartment gallery in San Francisco, the only local we did. And a uh, new document which is a, a new document, which is a publishing house that's based between uh, Los Angeles and Vancouver. This is, we were thinking very much about hospitality at the time. It was like in the writing we wrote about this project, that was the, the key idea was that, like how can we be hospitable, not just to artists, but to other curators. I think, and, and part of it is like our desire. And I think how we program our exhibitions is that there is a tendency in the Bay Area to be very insular and to kind of just pay attention to itself and have sort of an outsized uh, perception of the Bay Area in relation to other parts of the world. And so what we're always trying to do is to kind of expand that and expand the conversation to people who aren't based in the Bay Area but based nationally or internationally and with other spaces so that it doesn't feel like we're just looking at ourselves. Yeah, we, we, I mean, for the sake of also, we want we want the, the places beyond the Bay Area to look at us, like to see the artists that we have locally. This is a different show. So, so this, this space came to an end um, for one reason or another, financial, I guess, mainly. Um, and it was a lot running two spaces and curating two spaces. And in this space, not only curating, but, but collaborating with another curator to organize exhibitions. But not long thereafter, because that I'm a, a, this is what I do, uh, I talked a uh, local space ratio three into renting us the, a, a side space they were using for storage in the Mission District. So then we opened our new current second gallery um, we, I mean, it's a, it's a sort of ridiculous notion of the sort of mega gallery with uh, multiple locations, galleries in New York City that have like an Upper East Side version, or they have two different pieces in Chelsea, or they have one in Chelsea, but they open a project space in the Lower East Side. Ours is, it, our in, inspiration for doing this is certainly not financial in that way. It's, it's really out of a need. There's just not enough good art in the Bay Area, just plain and simple. So we want to bring more of it. Our first show in the new space was a show with Joanna Billing again. We played a, a show called Pulham. Oh, what was the last name of it? It was a it was a piece that involved a, a on the one hand a woman driving to 
a warehouse in which a piano sat and playing a, a piece of, of piano music. And on the other hand, a large line of cars driving through, uh, what was it, I believe in Ireland, just, just all different types of regular people and the cars essentially stopping and everybody getting out and just kind of being together. A kind of a being together that feels, I don't know, I feel a nostalgia for it today. Like that image actually thinking back to that work when as I was putting this together kind of felt both frightening that idea of being suddenly so close to so many people, but also kind of thrilling. We paired this uh, single video by Joanna with uh, an older artist, um, Betty Bailey, who just passed away earlier this year. Um, Betty uh, and her husband, Clayton Bailey, are artists who've been in the Bay Area essentially forever. If, they, if you asked her, that's how she would describe it. They were kind of, Clayton and Betty were kind of coming up in the same moment as like Roy DeForest and Robert Ernestson and like Peter Saul and like all of these sort of like California, I guess, funk artists. Yeah, and so Clayton makes a, a lot of strange robots out of metal and like this strange pseudoscience. And Betty primarily made these, these color pencil drawings often some kind of joke, like, like literally like little like small punchline jokes and, and the drawings are fantastic. Uh, we drove, well, took a train and then a, you know, a, a car to see what is the, the Bailey Museum, a small museum that they ran themselves featuring both of their work, mostly his work, but her work on all the walls uh, in, a, in a small town up the, up the kind of north, most northern part of the East Bay where we live. Um, and yeah, we're enthralled by this work, still think about it all the time. This again, this is this sort of like, this is an artist who hadn't shown in a gallery since the 80s. Uh, paired with a gallery that shows sort of in larger institutional shows in uh, in Europe, and it, and it, and it was lovely. Um, yeah, she was a fantastic person, and the the show was in the in the local newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, and I just remember her saying like how, just, how it's going to make all our friends jealous. Yeah, yeah, we got a, an article actually was written about it. These are just some more recent shows. This is a, a show of paintings by Matea Proda. This is our the, this the new space. Behind the central wall uh, is a large empty studio in which an artist we love, Koak, maintains her studio. Um, she's not an artist we represent or work with anymore. She's grown far bigger than us, um, which is great. Um, but her partner, Kevin Kruger, joined the gallery. Um, he had a space called uh, Alter Space that we loved. And we convinced him, slowly but surely, to join the gallery. The initial co director of the gallery had left, but we're always trying to keep both collaborating with other people and then collaborating closely now with Kevin Kruger. This artist, Matea Proda, is an artist that he was close with and had worked with previously. And we're like happy to be working with her. Um, let's see, here's another show. Here's that, that Andrew Chapman from earlier. Here's another show, his most recent solo show. Uh, in the center is a large sculptural painting. Um, on the left is another gargantuan painting uh, on the right closest, I guess, underneath the pictures of each of the participants is a, a strange fuzzy portrait. And then, the portrait and then yeah, and then there's this. these large pale things which look as if they were cut out of a wall. Like they're fully constructed walls with uh, wainscoting and- uh, Light switches. And outlets. And yeah. outlets. And some strange embedded uh, photographs. He's someone who won't tell us what his work is about. He's someone we're committed to as, as, a, as a gallery, but he is constantly uh, frustrating any attempts to understand what's going on and kind of find that thrilling and frustrating. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's where we're at right now. This is, this is this. Oh. I think this has, a, is a clip from a video piece that we showed um, a few years back. I wonder if the sound is proper. I'll turn up the volume really loud. Here is a car. You can look at it. You can roll in it. You can walk around it. 
You can speed in it. You can talk about it. Discuss it. You can cruise in it. You can fill it up. Repair it. You can sleep in it. You can think about it. Let's look at it. Let's think about it. Avant time. Avant time. So that's a piece by Simone de Breimoller, who is an artist that uh, I met a, long, a while ago um, as, when I was an intern at YBCA. His partner, Nina Beyer, had a show there, and he came out for it. Um, and I think it kind of gets into this interest that is, it's an, sort of an ongoing interest for both of us about how objects or animals or actions as, as substitutes or stand-ins for other things as like avatars. So I curated this show in Chinatown in 2015. Uh, the title was technically the eggplant emoji, but if it had to be written out, it was called aubergine. Uh, I was interested in, through like texting and just online that the way eggplants became a stand-in for the body. And I was less interested in the sexual aspects of the pheno phenomenon than I was with the use of imagery as an avatar and um, something that was recognizable. So I approached a group of artists with the idea and I asked them to think about, about that and wanted to wanted to make clear to them that this was sort of a concept that they can kind of push and pull as far as they could. And I, I didn't want to have a preconceived idea of like what the show is supposed to look like and what, what I wanted from them. I just kind of wanted to lay out this sort of open invitation. Um, so that's ended up being the show. Um, it was kind of, the, the prompt was like this sort of jumping off point. And so all the works became these very unexpected works. So there's the video by Simone. Uh, there is uh, this textile piece by Ezra Canabalari. This piece that was supposed to have sprouting potatoes, but ended up just being a little gross <laughs> by Nicholas Andre Sung. Um, this sculpture. Uh, by Sydney Shen and a work by Puppies Puppies. Um, so for Simone also contributed this work of uh, pipes and flutes in different paintings or historical paintings and just even album covers that we he sent us the files and we just printed out stickers at Kinko's and stuck them wherever felt right as long as the people were kind of like glancing at each other. I thought about this recently, this show, which is, I, I'm, it's funny to go back in time a little bit, but this is a show I was very proud of that, that Jackie created. Um, and we found these stickers recently and put a couple of them up in our house. So there's these two guys uh, smoking a pipe. One paint playing a flute. No, but in our house. Oh, you yeah. Know. Um, so this piece by Ezra Canabalari is called uh, Tazba. And it was a fab, the fabric is a piece that you, that was sort of a kind of of deconstructed Turkish robe and a tazba, which is a string of prayer, prayer beads. And she had made these out of olive pits that she's collected from living at home. Yeah, there, it was a lovely object. And then for the show, um, this was the second time we've worked with uh, the artist Puppies Puppies, who um, Jade Olivio, and um, who's just an amazingly thoughtful and just like wonderfully genuine artists. Um, they're often, often the works are ready made and they often incorporate an aspect of pop culture. In, in older works, there's Minions and, or Gollum or Olaf from Frozen or Voldemort. And, but they're also incredibly personal and incredibly like, I don't know, they're very genuine and very touching works. Um, so this work, this is a work that they made with their then partner and they went to a wax museum outside of Dallas, which is where they're from. And um, at the wax museum, they have like a booth where you can make a souvenir cast of your hand out of wax. Um, so they went to the station, they made this hand gesture 
that when together mimic a sex act and the, the use of color is important here because the blue and yellow mix to form green and for, for puppies puppies it's, it's the act of mixing colors is like a, akin to a romantic gesture. Um, the process of making the piece was sort of a public proclamation for, for the love of their partner and um, which was something that they really struggled with um, coming out when they were growing up in Texas. Yeah, that, I mean, that this idea of doing this sort of, this public performance construction, like public sculpture making, declaring like, uh, like, uh, like queer love in a place where they didn't feel um, that that was a safe gesture. Um, I don't know, it meant a lot. I think that that's, a, this is a, a, was a tough, is a tough practice um, for some people. Um, because of it's it's there's an intensity to this like this manner of dealing with 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 pop culture and dealing with reality. Um, Jade's recent work has gotten even more intense, um, de dealing with politics, um, dealing with dealing with transgender rights, and yeah, it's but it's all very it's very like I think in if we're thinking about artists who have a tremendous amount of care in their work. Uh, she is someone who really, really has that. Yeah. So, so the idea of, of using a theme and posing it as a question versus just like a be all end all like thematic is, is very like a common way of how we think about shows, how we think about working with artists, how we think about curating, um, we're less interested in curating artworks as we are curating practices. And when we're working with artists, we're not interested in discrete artworks necessarily, but we're interested in their practice overall and how it evolves and how it can really take lots of different forms. I'm not sure how much more time we have. This is another wonderful show Jackie curated. Yeah. So Who's, this, what? No, no. Maybe talk about this work. Or? Okay, so that work. Uh, um, so uh, a couple of years ago, I was invited to uh, curate two shows at this project space that they opened at the at Mills College. They took the former room where the slide library was and they emptied it out because nobody uses physical slides anymore and they turned into a project space for um, students and of not just in the art department but all it was open to any student on campus to use for exhibitions or for performances or anything like that um, so the first show the only it was there was a really strange in instance where they asked me to for the first show to kind of deal with identity in some way and and I was I didn't really I had a little bit of a hard time like understanding wrapping my head around like what that means um, for myself and for what I was interested in doing and so uh, we I came up with this this idea of like how how identity can be formed through like interior ideas of who one is but then also informed by a lot of exterior uh forces so this is a still um of a video by masabi kukova um and she her family grew when her family were um what is that what was that called i'm not sure yeah oh, well anyway, we can skip yeah um so through this through this show i was able to um borrow works from these two local collectors and they had this beautiful zadeli muhali um photograph um and she is a, an african artist and she, photographer and she really um, is interested in depictions of women in Africa, women in the queer community in Africa, and really kind of centering their, their narratives.
Um, and so this is a print by Lauren Halsey. Um, I think we talked about yesterday and, um, and her piece at the Hammer Museum, and this is one of her early prints that she had made uh, reflecting the signs that she saw in Crenshaw. So I think we, I wanted to kind of, it goes into like this direction of things that we're interested in. Interested in. Um, so a few years ago, Joan Jonas gave this talk at um, CCA, and she's an artist who's, whose work I'm really interested in, and whose work, large scale projects, like uh, she did, they did a show of her work at the Fort Mason Center in San Francisco, and that was the, one of the only times where I was able to see one of her large scale works in person. Um, but she spoke about a lot of different projects. Um, and this was the, the shape, the scent, and the feel of things that was a performance at Dia Beacon. And um, the piece is a response to Abby Warburg's essay about his visit to the American Southwest, but it's also about ritual and the impact of memory on the land. Um, and then the, during, this, during the talk, there's this footage of her pulling the wagon with the stuffed dog on it. And it really, really sat, like, struck me in this really interesting way. And the, she has a way of when she's talking about her relationship with animals like she turned this very cold lecture room into a sort of it felt more inviting when she was talking about her pets and her her living with these animals that she loved and she ended her talk with a, a video piece of her dog wearing a camera around his on Rena's collar running across the beach. And it was so absurd and it was so charged and it was through this like this goofy perspective of the dog. And it was, um, I just remember at the lecture, there were like so many people who started leaving and they were like, this is insane and this doesn't make any sense. But I was sitting there the whole time going, yeah, this totally makes sense to me. We always joke about there's a scene and in, 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 uh, the Muppets go to Manhattan in which Kermit the Frog, uh, who is normally a sweet and generous guy, has been kind of brainwashed, or he's, he's amnesia, amnesia, and he's hanging out with these stockbrokers, um, and the the Muppet gang goes to try to rescue uh, Kermit, and they, they encounter Kermit, and they're like, Kermit, don't you remember me? And, and Kermit proceeds to just roast all of the Muppets. Mostly Miss Piggy. Mostly Miss Piggy. Um, and you can see Fozzie Bear in the background and Fozzie Bear, and it, it, it's par partially due to just the way Fozzie Bear's puppet face is constructed, but it looks like, like Fozzie Bear is frustrated. Uh, I mean, is, is, is not, he's not uh, empathizing with Miss Piggy and, and, and her plight as someone being roasted. He's taking notes because he's excited as a comedian. Yeah, he kind of has this like open mouth of like, yeah, yeah this, this is all, this is all fire. And I, I think there are these moments in life where like, like maybe for an average person or for a different kind of person with a different aesthetic, they, they would be like, the, the work might run aground. But for us, we're just like, that's the moment. That's like the thing clicks. that catches for us. Yeah. So I think that, that kind of, I'm really interested in thinking a lot about companion species and kinship with animals and uh, the Donna Haraway calls it a relationships of significant otherness. Um, thinking about like how we humanize animals, whether that's like a good thing or a bad thing. Um, you know, how some people can empathize with animals more than other humans. I think we may be out of time almost. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was, okay. see if there's anything. Another, we'll just go over one more interest. Um, this is the work by uh, Nicole, a work by Nicole Vermers. Uh, she's German, I suppose, mm -hmm. based artist, uh, these sort of, uh, Milos Bowman chairs, or I'm, I'm not sure who designed them, um, with these furs over them. And we're also interested in, in the way that, that humans take up space in the world. Um, that gesture of putting a coat over the back of a chair as a way in which one claims space, um, the way one claims space on a dance floor. Um, like in a, in, a, in a world in which so much of what, what makes up the structure of things is uh, is like preconceived and uh, set into stone by sort of 
like capitalist systems that seem intractable. There are these quiet moments in which humans take up space and claim space. It's just two more pictures. We'll just finish them. Oh, tell this story. Oh yeah, I got really, really obsessed with this article that was in the New Yorker about this chef who runs a restaurant in like upst upstate New York near Albany. And it was supposedly one of the world's most like exclusive tables and tables are booked through 2025. And there's like this, this whole mythos built around this place, making all of his own ingredients, sources everything from his property, well, with the exception of fish and meat, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the article has like this really interesting angle of like being skeptical of this restaurant and the chef and it, and it comes out that everyone who's eaten there like snuck in a table between reservations and uh, you know, like it's, there's yeah, like, a lot of inconsistencies in the story of this restaurant and it's sort of, uh, there's like this really interesting thing that I was interested like about like deception or elaborate, elaborated truths. Um, but this is a yeah. restaurant where a meal would probably take five hours to eat. And if every table is booked till 2025, how can anybody sneak in between anybody? And if every story is only those people who've snuck in, were there people in the other space? We like stories that question the sort of the edge between truth and reality. Um, those are those we find those moments very inspiring. And maybe we'll end at this piece. This is a, a work by Lutz Bacher, um, an artist who who passed away maybe three years ago. No, maybe, like last year. Last year, yes, yeah, so recently. Um, their work, I'm trying to think, the first time I saw their work was a show at Ratio 3, our current neighbor. Um, the entire floor of this massive gallery, 1,500 square foot gallery, was covered in little tiny gray, like, like stress balls. Stress balls. And on the wall were these, these uh, found pictures of, the, of, the, of stars, these like pulled from a book, each of the individual pages framed. Um, and then there were some other weird components to that that show. There she, was like a, a kind of privacy glass over a poster of uh, from Twilight of like Edward Cullen from Twilight. Yeah. She's an amazing artist because at, at no stage in her career did she settle for a set of materials for um, a, a style other than this sort of irreverence um, uh, which like it was at, at times political and then at times like purely strange in a way that like one, I don't know, we, we just kind of, it's like an aspirational character. Yeah, I think the, the aspect of like surprise is, is something that we really enjoy about working with artists and about certain art practices. Um, yeah, collaboration yeah. and surprise. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's enough of us talking. It seemed like maybe it was going longer than intended, for which I apologize, but we would love to answer questions and such. We can leave this picture on though, it's not so bad. So if anyone who wants to ask questions can raise their hand and, and, and be promoted to a panelist or just type it in the chat or the Q&A. Who doesn't want a promotion? <laughs> This awkward silence moment is when in five or six people are typing simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was the modern way. <laughs> Q&A. Q&A, I see a thing. Why do you check for a slow cause? I don't have no idea. You know, it's, well, that's an, it's funny because I'm always like, well, answer any question. Like that's a peculiar question. Um, it, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Why does anybody like anything labeled Supreme? It's not a better shoe because it says Supreme. It just says Supreme. At some point, something has enough steam behind it that it kind of rolls on its own, you know, of its own kind of, it's like, it's rolling down the hill at this point. So that would be my answer to that. It's like so once something becomes a pop culture icon, people are very loath to uh, get rid of it. Done. <laughs> I know that's very. It let scary. us click done, which was nice. But yeah, it's it's I I don't know about like the prevalence of like artists like cause or 
I don't know, other artists are like similar, like why that manages to catch on with, uh, with, you know, tech bros or with certain folks. Yeah, exactly. Like Shepard Fairey. Shepard Fairey or, I mean, it's, it's really not, I just, it's nothing to worry about, right? It's like a, it's liking things in life. I don't know why anyone likes so much music, right? It's, it's, it's a, it's a thing where it's not for me to, it, it's not worth wondering why someone likes something. It's, it's more interesting to try to, I, maybe even like to, 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 not to play devil's advocate, but to figure out if there is something that you're diametrically opposed to, how can you twist it in such a way that you like it? But for an example would be for the longest time, we never got around to showing anything that looks like uh, figurative art. Um, but then people would, would ask about it. And then when we finally did, and people were like, oh, I didn't know you showed this kind of work. We're like, no, we just didn't like any of it till now. Or like nothing hit us <laughs> in a way that we really wanted to show it. The same for photography. We rarely show photography, but there's photography we like, just never comes up. Okay, so we can go to- Yeah, other questions. Amy, go, go. Amy's question, I'm really interested in this idea of being interested in practices. How does that idea approach how you seek artists or find them? I. I mean, we're always looking, we're constantly, I mean, now we're mostly looking online, but I think we were trying to go to a lot of shows and whenever we traveled, we would go to as many shows as we could, try to see a lot of different galleries. Um, we're really fortunate that a lot of our friends are artists. And so um, sometimes we'll find an artist because someone we know is like, hey, you should look at this person's work. and. It usually, once we, there's like something that kind of sparks something in us that we're, it often involves like sort of a deep dive, like, okay, well, let's look at their website and look at what they've done. Let's look at past shows. Yeah. And so that's kind of how we, it's sort of a very like, it's almost like research based, like looking yeah. at, looking at artists. I yeah. think, I think though, then, then then it becomes a process of conversation having with artists a lot of the time, like having conversations over time um, to get to know them, to get to know whether or not there's someone that we can form a trusting relationship with to have a show. Um, it's, it's not necessarily about artists being particularly outgoing, but you know, even a really quiet person can be sincere. You know? Yeah. Right, what's, what's another okay. question? Good. We can do that one. Oh yeah, okay. How do you think that the culture or flavor of the Bay Area affects your ability to create community and utilize hospitality in a curatorial spaces, opposed to larger art markets? It's interesting. I think that the type of work we do isn't dissimilar to work that happens at project spaces around the world, um, whether they're in St. Louis or Baltimore or, or Houston or, or Austin. Um, some cities have more or less of these. Um, Right now, Chicago has a lot more interesting art than San Francisco, which is, I, I always used to say it was New York, LA, San Francisco, Chicago tied, but right now Chicago has really <laughs> kind of grown in the last few years in a way that's like, I, looked, I look up to, um, if, they're, if they could only fix that weather. I think to a degree, in terms of like having at all, like I don't, I don't necessarily know if it would be possible to do something like it might be possible, but I think it would be much, much harder to do something like that in New York. I think, I think about like our peers who have galleries there and they really had to like kind of hit the ground running to kind of be where they're at. And a lot of our peers are, or our people who are sort of came up at the same time are much more successful than we are financially. Um, but I think, so I think that aspect of having a commercial space might not necessarily have worked for us in New York, but I think the project, purely project space version of et al, I think could exist there. It would just kind of take a different form. And I think it would feel like there's more competition for other things that people can be doing um, as well. The Bay Area, a funny thing is there's a lot of history of art in the Bay Area. And the, fortunately, we're not by any means alone. There, in being interested in that history. There are galleries in LA, like The Landing and, um, uh, what's his name's gallery? Parker. Parker Gallery that are like currently, mining is, this, is, is, the, is the word one would use, but in a, it's 
apt in, in too many different ways. The history of the Bay Area artists and, and giving them shows again, giving them maybe their first solo show in many years, um, kind of, again, resurrecting. All these terms are, are loaded in a way I'm not happy with, but bringing these careers kind of back into to the public view, bringing practices back out. So there's a history there that we're interested in. Um, but we're as interested in connecting that history to, to work that's not local. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, let's see. Dude, Jenny on Alon's computer. Uh, what are your ideas about putting together shows during the pandemic? Will your process change or have they already? We've had a lot of shows delayed. I mean, there was, there's a, the, the, rea the on the ground reality is we were closed for four months. Um, we had to reorganize shows. We have shows with our, we had a show in November, well, it would have been in September, but the artist is, is not young and not excited to fly right now. So we put it off another month. It's a little bit of a, a right now, a negotiation with the artists whose shows have been delayed um, to figure out how best to make their shows happen as soon as possible yeah. while respecting the schedule that would have already happened in the fall. Yeah, and I think other shifts is that, you know, we started doing, we started doing these like occasional shows on Animal Crossing on, and like having Zoom openings and sort of like, understanding that it's kind of like a goofy idea and kind of a, a weird one that not everyone would be super into and being like okay well this is like a bizarre idea but it also seems kind of fun and silly to do and, and has like a little levity in this really strange time and so that was like one thing that we were like okay well if we're all online if we're all on zoom let's let's try this out yeah um but but rec but kind of double down on the absurdity of, of calling looking at something in zoom art by by placing that art in pixelated versions in our, in our Animal Crossing home. We did three shows so far, and I think a fourth Four. is waiting. We, we were about to do a fourth right before the George Floyd protests began, and the artist is, is that we were gonna work with is, is con very concerned about, about the issues regarding policing, and I was like, I think we need to put off this show a little bit to, before, you know, while things are, are going on, and, and the artist essentially said, I don't care if this show doesn't happen until 2026, as long as we can get rid of police, which was kind of yeah. very reasonable. Of but the we artist. did, I, we, uh, we, I also found out that um, the artist Naylan Blake also really, is really into Animal Crossing right now. And so on Twitter, I just sent him a DM and I was like, hey, do you want to do a show? And so I think that could poss is possibly on the horizon. I did a studio visit on Nayland's Island, which was really cool and really goofy. Yeah. Um, okay, so Todd asked, how do you reach out to artists? Do you reach out to artists first or do studio visits or do artists contact you with an idea for an exhibition? Artists contact us all the time with ideas for exhibitions. We never do those exhibitions. There, there's I, probably, I think there's one exception I won't, yeah. I won't name the person, but yeah, I th generally speaking, it's a, a slower process of, of getting to know practices through seeing them in the world, which is, you know, leaves a, a, is not a perfect process because if an artist isn't, it, it's a, it's, you know, there's a bit of a catch 22. If you're not in a show, how did Aaron and Jackie see your show to give you a show, et cetera, et cetera. That is sometimes worked around by artists telling me, hey, my friend hasn't shown in a while. They're a really good painter. You should talk to them. And we and we listen to people. So it's really a, us listening, reaching out, and looking more so than people reaching out to us with ideas. That being said, and I, I've slipped a little bit, but over the seven years of et al., like I think I'm the only gallery that responds to someone sending us a blind submission. More yeah. often than not, the response is hi, you know, this is Aaron with et al. Um, thanks for your submission. You probably need, most of the time it's work that looks nothing like what we show, like doesn't make any sense. Uh, like I'll be very kind of clear, like you should probably need to do a better job of directing your, your efforts to getting shows to galleries that make sense. Like what are galleries near you that show work similar to yourself? Like uh, we, there's, again, like we don't want to feature artists that are necessarily extroverts, but there's something to be said for artists that, that are participating in the community, um, going to shows, uh, being in shows, curating shows in their basement, et cetera. Like if, if you're an artist who doesn't go to all the shows, doesn't like actively enjoy going to art shows, it's, it's a hard thing to expect that people want to go to yours. So 
So mostly reaching out to people um, after we've kind of gleaned that there's something interesting there. Yeah, lots of studio visits. And lots of the, ch the idea, the chance what for us for doing a studio visit is, is a chance for us to kind of see if there is like any sort of common threads that we might be interested in, or like, is this a person that we can be in conversation for a while? Because it's, we're, we don't necessarily want to be in a sort of relationship with an artist that's sort of one and done. We very, it, it would be very easy to run a version of the gallery in which we send emails to the painters we know are selling paintings around the world and just have them ship out some paintings. It's, it's a very easy process. I mean, it's hard to be an art dealer like that. It's hard to be a real art dealer that goes to the right parties and knows the right people and gets art into museum collections and things. That's a, a skill that we're just, we're not, we don't have. Um, there's like, there's like a, a, um, a Simpsons episode where they, where this family goes to Itchy and Scratchy Land and like one of the animatronics like show, like takes off like the top of their head and you see all like the electronics and computer chips of like the robot and Marge goes to Homer like, see Homer, that's why your robot didn't work. And so we see those other dealers who are really good at that and we're like, yeah, that's why that's our, our robot, robot doesn't, doesn't work. work. I mean, we're quite happy with things the way they are, but, but we recognize that there's a type of dealing we could do, which is a little bit less personal, but potentially more lucrative for the artist in the gallery. Um, yeah. Um, any other questions? We will answer any question. <laughs> Even even questions about cause are, are fair game, apparently. <laughs> so I think that that sounds good for tonight. So thank you so much. You're very welcome for all of your your contributions this week and for your wonderful talk and great images this evening. So, um, but the adventure continues tomorrow with the seminar. And, uh, and I heard that there's some people getting together at the art house in the courtyard. So that's uh, very nice. Um, but, uh, but for now, maybe we'll just say thank you and, and good night. Yeah, hey, thank you all thanks. tremendously. We're very happy to be here. Awesome. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. <laughs> okay, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Talk to you later. Bye.